We will not be afraid in the future missions which are coming, are coming soon, about which I want to uh, say something about in a second part of the speech, so forgive me if this doesn't speak too directly about how the movement, in my view, can begin to take uh, crucial steps forward. But uh, because of the uh, enforced absence of our friend from Turkey, an outrageously enforced absence from, by, of our friend from Turkey, I'm going to have to speak again uh, towards the end and address those questions. But we need now to think strategically. We need determination and we also need to think strategically. It is perhaps an indictment that the daily deaths and humiliations of the Palestinian people are, have not been the cause of the level of outrage at the deaths of the nine people aboard the Mavi Marmara. But sometimes history works in this way. 36 years ago, two young Jewish civil rights activists from New York headed south, Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner, to find themselves murdered alongside a local activist, the black man James Cheney, in that boiling swamp of hatred in Mississippi in, on June 21, 1964. It was a grievous loss, particularly for those closest to them, but it served a turning point in the civil rights movement, the wider movement for black liberation. And I believe that turning point is upon us now. The question is not, is this a turning point? The question is, on the Palestine, uh, to, to liberation in Palestine. Our opponents and enemies are on the back foot, but they're running fast to try to get back onto the front foot, and we must understand what they're trying to do. First of all, they're attempting to isolate, to denigrate, and to calumniate against the government of Turkey, the people of Turkey, and in particular, the magnificent civil society organisation, the IHH, led by Bülent Yildirim. And we, as an international movement, cannot allow the Turkish movement to be so isolated. If they isolate those who have been in the front rank, they will throw everybody back and we will be back further back than where we were when we started. We cannot allow that to happen. In particular, we must refute absolutely the idea that, the, that murders took place aboard the Mavi Marmara were that those murders were in some sense the fault of those of us, particularly the Turkish brothers and sisters who were aboard the Mavi Marmara. The most absurd spurious justifications are coming out. You read that Israeli commandos faced a lynch mob. Well, this must be the first you have experience in this country of lynch mobs. But this must be the first lynch mob in which the victims pursued the aggressor in order to defend themselves from the aggressor's violence. That must be the first lynch mob in history. Be clear, in all the great legal, moral and religious codes, the victims of lethal violence have an absolute right to collectively defend themselves with their bare hands and with whatever lies to hand. <laughs> Reverend, I'm, Reverend I'm, minded, I'm minded of what Malcolm might have said about this. Perhaps he might have said, we didn't land on Israel, Israel landed on us. So we mustn't allow this argument to gain ground. And further, across the world now, all those who've been moved by this issue need to step into the front rank of the movement alongside those in Turkey who've lost their loved ones. From Vancouver to Lake Van, from Casablanca to Kuwait, from all four points of the compass, we must mobilize now to head back to Gaza and through Gaza towards the liberation of Palestine as a whole. This is the Sharpeville and the Soweto of the movement 
of solidarity with the Palestinian people, not of the Palestinians themselves. For the Palestinians have seen more and more massive massacres than that which took place two weeks ago aboard the Mavi Marmara. From Dae Yassin, through Black September, through Sabra and Shatila, through the assaults, the atrocities against the people of Gaza 18 months ago. Not of the Palestinians, but of the movement of those who stand with them, the Sharpeville and the Soweto. And we must recall, remember and treasure the lessons of the great struggle against apartheid. There was a time when apartheid seemed invulnerable, invincible, a time when it would say it did not care about UN security resolutions, just as Israel does today. A time when it said that it did not care about any government's attitude, provided it continued to have the support of the United States of America, or at least its government, just like Israel does today. But that was progressively broken down, and it, apartheid in South Africa was isolated from without and undermined from within. And this is what we need to set in our own minds. You see, I believe that a crucial step now is for those of us who have perhaps been more aware than the average or more active than the average over this question over these years to open ourselves wider to new forces and I think that there are some of them here tonight who are perhaps addressing this question and looking at this question for the first time all through fresh eyes. People who have been moved as never before by the atrocities on the, Mas on the Mavi Marmara. That's happening in the United States. There was a very important article in the New York Review of Books two weeks ago which analysed a survey of opinion of young Jewish people in the United States of America. It found an increasing number of young Jewish people who do not have a blank check for Israel but hold Israel to the same universal standards of behaviour that everybody else should be held to. This is an important step forward. There will be others asking this question. How is it that every year the White House's billions of dollars of subventions to the State of Israel are voted through by the Congress to pay for the weapons, the very bullets, the five bullets that were fired into the body of Furkan Doan, an American citizen. What is in it? for the average citizen in the United States of America to pay a foreign power to kill your own citizens? These are questions that must be asked. They are questions we must encourage other people to ask. And we should have no fear at all about how far and wide this movement can go. The attempts to silence and intimidate are weakening. A journalist asked me before this meeting, was I concerned about the protest outside? I said, what protest? I couldn't see a protest for the flood of people who were coming in. I first, spoke, I first spoke on the subject of Palestine in New York City at Columbia University 18, months, uh, 18 years ago in the fall of 1992. It was a big meeting. We had 500 people. Problem was, only about 30 or 40 of them supported us and the rest of them were on the other side. That's not the case now. My friend and comrade George Galloway was speaking in Texas, in Dallas, on the night of the massacre of the Mavi Marmara. 1,200 people turned up to a meeting in Dallas. These are the numbers that we should think now. And if we can change the public opinion here and in Europe, but above all here, if our movement can become more than a movement of activists, you see, every movement needs activists, but we cannot just be a movement of activists. We must become a movement of people, a movement of social forces, a movement of the mass democratic forces in this country and in the Middle East that have the key to liberate the people of Palestine. This is the challenge that we face now. I want to finish and return to perhaps some of the concrete steps later. Remember the struggle against apartheid. Remember the apartheid abomination could murder 69 people in Sharpeville. It could gun down Hector Peterson and hundreds of school students in Soweto. It could torture and execute our prince, Steve Biko. 
It could assassinate our lion, Chris Harney. But the giant Mandela did walk free. Apartheid did fall. Gaza will be liberated. The siege will be lifted. The apartheid wall will fall. Together, together, to Gaza, through Gaza, to a Palestine. Free, sovereign, dignified. Hata al-Nasser, Hata al-Nasser, Hata al-Quds.